Hi, everybody. My name is Christine Negovani. I'm a junior dual enrolled at both Bell Phillips Memorial High School and MATC through the STEM Academy program. And I'm also a member of the Dane County Youth Environmental Committee. We're now down to the last and perhaps the most important part of our day, which is committing ourselves, both in our individual lives and as schools and communities, to ways that we can combat climate change. So joined with me up here is a panel of students from Dane County who I'm gonna get started with interviewing before we turn the conversation over to all of you. So Krishna, would you like to start with introducing yourself? Sure, why not? Oh, there we go. Uh, I am Krishna Elwell, a junior from Monona Grove, and I am here representing the DCYC as well as the Connection. He, him, if you're interested. Uh, I'm here with Model U, or because of Model UN, I guess, and then a big part of what shaped my environmental beliefs has been being in scouts um, and just experiencing the outdoors a lot. Um, my can y'all hear me? All right. Um, my name is Kajada. My, name, my pronouns are she, her, hers. I'm a senior at Madison East High School, and I am a teen editor at the Simpson Street Free Press. Okay. Thank you all for serving on the panel today. So now that we're almost done with our day, my first question to you all is, what were the most important takeaways for you from the conference today? And if you had to point out a couple of things that made you really sit up and take notice, what were they? Kajada, would you like to go first? Um, sure. So the first thing, I would say the most important thing that stood out to me was um, Michaela's presentation about communication, um, which is something that I'm constantly working on, not just talking about climate change, but in other issues in my communities, about how we can reframe the ways that we think about certain issues that affect us so that everyone can have a part in them and that everyone understands their role in um, the issues that affect us all, especially when it comes to communities of color um, and communities in other places that we might not have as easy, as, e as easily a connection with and how we can build those connections, um, especially important to me as um, a leader in my school in clubs like Black Student Union and starting to, not necessarily starting these conversations, but rather reintroducing them from the ways that you know, clubs like Green Club or other environmental organizations have introduced it and reiterating its importance to us as black students, as students of color, and the ways that we experience it differently than other students. Uh, I think what stood out to me the most was um, both the presentation and the panel on climate justice, um, because for a while, um, up until today, really, I kind of held my like environmental beliefs like as like a part of my whole belief set, but I hadn't really thought about how interconnected everything is. So hearing about how you know every issue really is just so interconnected, and how it was the climate, especially the environment, the world we live in, is just so tied in with everything, uh, was really eye-opening, and I definitely made me sit up and take notice. I guess. Now I feel like whenever teachers ask for something that really pops out to you. Sometimes a lot of what they look for in school is, you know, a statistic. That's what gets people's attention. Now, there was one statistic that I heard in Kathy's session, which was about what you can do on the local level. And it was about the cost of solar. Now, when it comes to climate change, for me, energy is, or energy or politics, is where a lot of my interest lies. So I want to turn this question over to you. Now, if you're in Kathy's session, Please don't cheat. But how much do you think solar costs have come down in the past 10 years, like percentage-wise? Any guesses? I'm sorry, what? 80, all right, that's a running guess. Do we have any more? 40, 40 all right. Anything else? OK, well, 80 and 40 are both wrong. And sorry, sorry. But 
in the past 10 years, so the cost of solar has come down 93%. Oh yeah, 93%, I mean, at least according to Kathy, and I trust her, so I'm willing to believe that. So that was something that was really important to me because um, um, just to give you a bit of my backstory here, a year ago, or last school year, I guess you could say, I was working on my uh, school board as we installed solar panels onto the roof of our high school. They produce about 50% of our energy, and they're going to save us a net of $1.5 million in 30 years. They have a minimum performance guarantee, which means no matter what, they're going to work. And uh, it's also a cash flow positive project, which means even though I'm not 30 years older, right now we're saving money. And so that kind of relates exactly to Kathy's point, which is why it really related to me. And I think that if you can see that progress in solar, you're going to see it across the board in renewables as well. I think it's really hopeful for our future. Wonderful. Thank you so much. And that, I didn't know about that 93% statistic. That's, that's really amazing. So um, in the video that we just watched, not too long ago, featuring Billie Eilish and marine biologist Dr. Ayana Elizabeth Johnson. Dr. Johnson talked about the fact that we are way past the point of defining just one best thing that we can do to combat climate change. And instead, we should be asking ourselves, what should we do first? So my question to the panel is, what are some of the things that high school students can do to fight climate change and protect the environment in their lives, homes, schools, and communities? Monroe, would you like to go first? Yeah, so I think um, for me personally, at least, a lot of what I've done uh, has to do with like how I consume products, the things I buy. Um, I tend to buy things that are either like reused or I'll be able to use for a, lo a long time or ideally both. Um, like this jacket, for example, um, is thrifted and then also is pretty durable. Um, this water bottle, I, as you can probably see, I've carried basically everywhere with me since middle school. Uh, it's a good way to like reduce waste. So it's all these little actions of like the things I buy or the things I use um, that I'll really like take a lot of more conscious thought than I normally would to make sure that I'm being as sustainable as I can be. And of course, not every purchase is going to be perfectly sustainable because the world we live in, that's just not possible. But I try to get as close as I can with as many purchases as I, as I can. Uh, additionally, this is getting harder because of the weather, but I've been biking to school as much as I can just to reduce the carbon emissions with um, transportation. Uh, that's just a few things I have. All right, I'll uh, um, add on to that. So relating back to Michaela's presentation this morning, of course her points are all about when it comes to climate change, you're going to make a difference not by coming in there with your facts or what you believe. You have to work with other people, compromise. And I know that sounds very high and mighty, but to give you a personal example of how there can be change in environment in different communities, uh, there's a town in the north of Wisconsin, you know, very rural, in the north woods, and of course, as I'm sure you can imagine, definitely leans red. Now, I spent a lot of my life there, practically grew up there, and one night I was having dinner at a restaurant, and this person didn't know me, but they were sitting right close to me the, from the table that was opposite of mine, and I was having a conversation uh, with um, one of my parents' friends. It started with the library and then somehow managed to go into uh, Brazil's deforestation, naturally, I suppose. And the m when she stood up to leave, uh, this person from across the table, she leaned over to me and said, yeah, that all sounds great, but you need to grow up. And then in true grown-up fashion, she proceeded to run out of the room. Anyway, so that's uh, interaction I had in that community, in that town. Just one. But, to counter that, do you want to know what um, uh, the main platform policies of the community? In their local government, their main priority is focused on, uh, among other things, water conservation, protecting the air quality, banning ATVs, which if you're unfamiliar, is basically like the equivalent of us like banning or reducing the use of SUVs. All pretty, you know, liberal, climate conscious uh, initiatives in a red community. So the point I want to drive here is that when it comes to making a change, not only is it important to use your voice, but it's also important to understand that the environment, wanting to protect it and to keep us all safe and healthy, that's not necessarily a red or blue issue. The way we phrase it 
is, the way people see it, that's partisan. Because you're not going to get a Democrat and a Republican to agree on the best way for businesses, for instance, to be more environmentally sustainable. But what you can get them to agree on is how green the grass in their backyard should be. We all like to have a green backyard instead of a brown and dead one. And so I'll conclude it with this. I know I've been rambling. It's getting there. But my main point I want to drive home here is that you have to use your voice. It doesn't matter if you want to go into a sustainabil sustainability career. It doesn't matter if you're talking to your friend or maybe some other purpose. Maybe you're talking to someone on social media, making a post about this. Using your voice but also finding a way to work with other people is the best foot forward. Two years ago, I never would have imagined I'd be in a position like this, and yet here I am. By using your voice, opportunities come to you. And so long as uh, we can all continue to speak, I think there's hope for the future. So with that, Kajada. My issue with a lot of social action, not just concerning climate change or climate action, is that we need to be better at shifting our focus. We, it's important to think small. It's important to think about the things that you consume, how many of those things you consume, how, if they can be reused, if they can be recycled, whether you, whether you bike or you take the bus or you drive to school every day. It's important to think about those things. But also, it's important to think big, right? Because in the end, whether or not you choose to drink from a straw or not, is not going to, to slow the warming of the planet, right? Because you drinking from that straw is not going to change the fact that the person next to you is, right? And that my issue with people saying that climate is caused by human activity is of course not false, right? But it's, it loses nuance because it's not everyone. It is a select few. And our action needs to be targeted towards that select few. And also that we almost, we relinquish our power when we decide that we're going to let elected officials decide what our fate is going to be, right? Voting only does so much. We are all good at things. We are all skilled at things. We all have ideas to share, ideas that have weight. And by giving on our part, deciding to give elected officials or people in power, celebrities, the power to decide for us, we lose some of that power ourselves. We have power as well. And I think that we need to zoom in and zoom out at the same time because there are environmental issues that are happening right here, right now that a lot of people aren't paying attention to. They would rather pay attention to the ocean levels rising. They would rather focus on flooding in another part of the world, which is very, very important, but those aren't things that are tangible to us right now. And we need to focus on the things that we can do, that the things that we can touch, the people that we can see right now, the people that we can listen to right now. Those are the things that we can do. Those are the things that we have the power to change. And we need to, like I said again, zoom in and zoom out to see the ways that our local and personal actions lead to
bigger change on a larger scale where we're holding the people that have caused this accountable. That is what I have to say. Thank you so much for that. Oh, uh, Sorry, go ahead. Yeah, uh, if I could add on to that, I think that was uh, possibly one of the most impactful things I've heard in a really long time, so <laughs> thank you for that. Um, I think holding those in power accountable is really a crucially important thing. Um, because right now, with the way our systems are working, companies aren't, their financials are really what they care about. They care about the investors, their bottom line. And there's no way we can really change that. Um, yes, there are some companies, few companies that are different, but at the end of the day, companies are often legally obligated even, where you can't even make the argument that executives are people too and they have morals. They're legally obligated to choose profit over anything else. And so while we exist in that kind of system where they're forced to choose profit, we, there has to be a way to financially incentivize and disincentivize, well, incentivize good acts and disincentivize acts that are killing our environment. And there are a lot of different paths to do that, but they're paths that aren't really being explored enough because so much of the emphasis is on our elected officials, our government, that are in many cases especially in the federal level, not always working in the best interests of the local level. There's, unfortunately, is quite a bit of corruption. Um, and so finding ways to think outside of the box, outside of conventional things, like I personally have been to a lot of marches on the state capitol, and the things we march for, they never seem to like quite stick. I don't know if anyone else has picked up on that feeling, but there's a feeling that like we do a march, it feels amazing, right? There are all these people, we're this passionate, there's this much energy, and then it dissipates and, and nothing really. And so we need to find ways outside of the conventional box to make that financial disincentive to reduce carbon, to make that change. And that's a really important way to shift our thinking. And there's a lot of thinking out there on how to do that. Um, but yeah, thank you. Now, obviously, I can't uh, make a point here as eloquently as Kajada did. And I really like Monroe's points, too. So I thought I would mention a fun fact here. I don't know if anyone has seen The Problem with Jon Stewart. I've only seen one episode. So I'm not an, any sort of expert on his uh, media these days. But the episode I watched ha was talking about uh, what people can do to be more sustainable. And of course, we all know the standard lines of recycle, use straws, all of those um, you know, good-natured, uh, simple actions that we're told, can make a difference. But do you want to guess the company that was actually the first to suggest making those changes? It wasn't Coca-Cola. It wasn't American Airlines, just to throw some company names out there. Actually, though, it was BP Oil, as in British Petroleum. Now, I think you can see a bit of a contradictory opinion there. An oil company telling people to be sustainable. The reason for this being, as explained by John Stewart, was that it was the oil company taking climate change, which was just becoming uh, known to the general public at the time, instead of taking the blame themselves for their own business practices, shifting it onto the consumers. And of course, uh, for a while, we've seen this tactic invade our media. And I'm not saying that what you do doesn't make a difference. Of course it does. Um, like uh, Monroe's changes here, wearing a sustainable jacket, water bottle. Does that make a difference? Of course it does. But there are some ch lifestyle changes that aren't always effective unless done en masse. For instance, one person going vegetarian, that's great, I support you, but we can all agree that a million people going vegetarian is going to be a lot more effective. So how do you translate one individual decision to ripple out to millions, and I think that's where you're going to find the change, at least on some issues. There are other places where you can make a difference all on your own. Uh, going back to what I said earlier, using your voice. I, I mean, now of course, it takes time for you to find an outlet and to be respected and to build yourself up, and maybe even change your opinions too, learn how to work with other people. That all takes time. I'm not saying it's a simple decision. You can't 
change your life in a day. Rome wasn't built in a day either. But I think that when it comes down to the first thing we can do to protect climate change, that's all going to be different for all of you. And I'm not saying that there's one right or wrong answer, but that's going to take time. And you cannot, you s we simply cannot afford for you to give up. Because if we all give up, then we are the last children the world will ever know. So anyways, on that inspiring note, does anyone else have anything to add? I kind of wanted to, thank you for that point, by the way, Krishna. Um, but I wanted to build off of what Monroe said about protesting. And, you know, I've had these ideas for a while that we, it just go, goes back again to the ways that, to our perspectives on how change works and how we give the power to decide to elected officials, right? Like, at the end of a protest, you've lost your voice, your feet are tired, and you feel like you've done something, right? But you don't see anything after that. And it's because, like you said, not just businesses, but also political leaders don't really have an incentive to listening to you. Especially us, because we can't even vote. We can't even vote. And things like petitions, right? You walk around numerous neighborhoods knocking on people's doors and asking them to support your cause. And then what? Right? Who, the person that receives that petition, what are they going to do with the information that you've given them? Do they have an incentive? Do they have, is there some reason why they really have to listen to you? And I think that, for me, I'm someone that's tired of trying to make people listen, right? Because so long what we've heard is, if somebody's not listening to you, you're going to make them listen. I'm tired of trying to make people listen. If they're not going to listen, I'm taking my two cents back and I'm taking them somewhere else, right? I'm taking them to people that care. Build your own communities. Build your own organizations. Like I said before, we all have things that we're good at. These changes don't just happen on a policy level. You have to give them something to care about. You have to use leverage. And you have to start building the change that you want to see. Stop relying on other people to make those changes for you. I think you all shared some really, really valuable thoughts and ideas about, you know, not just individual a action, but how it really is important to make things matter and be part of a collective whole. So my second to last question to you, and um, apologies, we might have to speed through this one a little bit just for the purpose of time, but um, what is your plan going forward? And it doesn't have to be individual. What is your plan going forward to combat climate change? Just a couple things. All right, we gotta keep it short on time here, so I'll just speed through this. Um, I know we've floated it, we're not entirely sure yet, last time I checked, but tomorrow DCYC is going to have a meeting, and hey, if you can't come for this month's meeting, we have them usually second Sunday of every month, so definitely feel free to come, but amazing solutions are always there, uh, great group of people, and yes, I am advertising for my own group, no, I'm not being paid to do so, I'm really sorry about that, but uh, that's one front that you can find solutions because, fun fact, uh, as I mentioned earlier about working with my school board, that was because they knew I was on DCYC. So that's one way that being part of an organization, using your voice, can lead to you making a difference in uh, politics, business, and your community. I think what I'm gonna start doing moving forward is making those connections, branching out, because I, I think I have a pretty good grasp. I think most of us have grasp of what the problem is. I have a general idea of the philosophy of solutions, but I don't really know how to get there. And I think that's something I need to do. So I'm going to educate myself, make connections, and start acting. Um, for me, 
um, just continuing to bring this to my communities at my school and in my neighborhoods, um, my family, um, because this is something that has impacted us all. And even if it takes, um, you know, taking a different route to explaining the importance of the situation, um, working on finding how we can make those connections so that people can understand how to start taking action. So for our last question to the panel, we really wanna focus on thinking big. So just briefly, you know, in a, in a brief sentence, in 2023, really using your imagination, what is the biggest and most ambitious news headline you would like to see regarding climate change? It doesn't have to be realistic, the sky's the limit. So whoever would like to share, feel free to go first. Yes, I know the mic's going to take a second to turn on. But if I had to think of something, I would say something along the lines of, um, well, okay, I know this can be controversial, but if done in a safe way, I would love to see some news about reopening nuclear uh, power plants. Like Wisconsin has three nuclear power plants, and do you want to know how many you use? One. That's 66% of unused potential. So, hey, look, math there. I know, it's crazy. Anyway, that's one thing I'd like to see, us investing more in renewable sources of energy. I think this might be a little more specific, but I think seeing like a major oil company file for bankruptcy um, <laughs> would be kind of my ideal headline. All of the world's wealth has been redistributed or something like that. Or like we all wake up and it's just a dream and it, none of it was real. <laughs> that would be Okay, thank you once again to our panel members today. That was a great discussion. So now it's time to turn it over to all of you. Um, basically how this is gonna work is I'm gonna reintroduce all of the questions, basically all of the questions that were asked to the panel today. And we're gonna ask you to discuss in your groups for about probably three, three-ish minutes. Um, so yeah, the first three, four, you know, what? whatever keeps us in the, in the time. So um, the first question, once again, to discuss at your tables is what were the most important things you heard or saw today that really stuck, stuck with you and why were they important? And I'll start the time now. Okay, this is about the time that we're gonna move on to the next question. Sorry to interrupt your discussions if you weren't done yet. Um, but the second question that I'm gonna pose to you is when you leave here today, what are two or three actions that you will take with you to live a more sustainable life or just to ensure a sustainable future? And you can start now. We're now going to move on to our last question of the day for you all. Um, again, this is the fun question. Feel free to go as big as you want. Um, and we're going to give you slightly more time for this one because at the end, we want you to appoint one person from your table group to share out to the whole group. Um, so once again, the question is, in 2023, what is the biggest and most ambitious headline you would like to see regarding climate change? And you can go ahead and start. Okay, everybody, this is a one minute, half minute warning. Make sure that you have your headline finalized and that you have the person who's gonna share ready to share. So I'm hearing the noise die down a little bit. So now we're gonna have um, a couple of people coming around with microphones. Um, they'll hand it to your table leader and you can just real quick share out your name and your headline for your group.
table one. I'm Xanthi. Our headline was to ha find like a perfect alternative to fossil fuels and just totally stop using fossil fuels. Hello. Okay. Uh, our table group was number two, and we chose Elon Musk files for bankruptcy. <laughs> We're table three, and ours was BP CEO loses major environmental lawsuit. Um, my name's Ada, and I'm at table four, and we had two. One is data shows that we have the, the world has reached net zero carbon emissions, and that all North American native land is given back. My name is Carson uh, at table five, and the solution that we agreed on, or uh, the headline, sorry, that we agreed on is a uh, global scale solar project in the Saharan Desert um, that is designed to power uh, essentially <laughs> the world. Uh, it's crazy how much energy can come from solar power, and in the Saharan Desert, a couple s hundred square miles even is an insane amount of energy that the entire world can utilize. We are table group six, and we said that high school students found the solution to climate change, and everything is over forever. Uh, that whale populations grow 30% and coral reefs start to grow back. Trying to go in order here. Let me to count again. Uh, we're at table sep 10, I know how this works. Uh, our headline was, New Law Passes Funding for Nuclear Power Facilities Across the U.S. Um, we didn't really settle on one, but uh, one of ours was, uh, World Leaders Agree to Binding Climate Treaty. We're, oh, we're table 12 and 18, and ours is banning fossil fuels. We're table 13, and ours was all nations agreed to new climate plan that's inclusive of developing countries and also highlighting indigenous peoples. We're table 14, and ours was all public transportation becomes electric. Okay, um, we're table 15, and we said that all trash in the ocean gets cleared up. Or table 16 and 17, and we said Governor Evers declares a climate emergency. Yeah. Uh, we're table 19, and we said the ozone layer is completely healed. I'm, I'm about myself, but I'll say that we've uh, slowed the rate of deforestation and we've stopped mass extinction of wildlife. I'm Quinn. This is table 22. And we said that a new law was passed outlawing all deforestation in the Amazon rainforest. I'm Layla, I'm at table 24, and we said um, that New York City declares 100% uh, use of renewable energy. Um, this is table seven and 25, and we said 100% of people believe in climate change and are doing something to prevent it or slow it.
I think that was everybody, yes? No? Oh, there's more over there. We're table 29, and we thought that we'd like to see the University of Wisconsin agrees to stop investing in fossil fuels. Sorry for that. <laughs> um, so again, I'm Kajada, and I'm a teen editor for the Simpson Free Free Press. Um, we are a student, run, a student newspaper on the south side of Madison. We have students from second grade all the way to seniors in high school writing about a variety of topics, but especially Wisconsin's environment. We currently have a running series. Um, we have been pretty up to date on our reporting about PFAS, um, invasive species, line five, which some of you guys learned about in today's breakout rooms. And you guys can read our publication online. We actually have a new site coming out this coming Tuesday, celebrating 30 years of our organization. And you guys can get a load of this student journalism and learn about what we do at Simpson Street. Thank you. All right. So Sturgeon mentioned this in his amazing video, but um, if you're interested in like reporting and for your school and what your green club is doing, you should definitely look into joining the connection. So being a reporter entails like writing articles or even like making infographics or taking photos and videos of actions that your school uh, is taking on related to the energy, environment, and climate change. And reporters can also do interviews and polls or surveys really anything you're interested in. And yeah, if you go next slide, uh, you can scan these QR codes for our website and our Instagram, and also sign up at the same table that Sturgeon was talking about for DCYEC, if you're interested over in the like back corner over there. I don't know, there's a poster for DCYEC, so you'll see it over there. And also, if you are coming to the DCYEC meeting tomorrow, and you have any leftover pumpkins, from like Halloween or anything like that, you should bring them because we're gonna do an activity with them. Um, we're gonna smash them. Yeah. We're gonna demolish them. Like, it's gonna be fun. Um, okay, and then also before we go, um, if you could please scan the QR code on this slide and fill out the conference feedback survey. Um, we really do read your feedback and use it to improve our future conferences, so we really appreciate you filling out the form. Thank you. Fantastic. All right, all right. Looks like we are just about ready to wrap on up. But before we do, I want to extend one more gigantic thank you to all of our sponsors and to all of you amazing people for showing up here. And I really encourage you, of course, to check out the amazing tables out there and remember to continue making some fantastic change wherever we go in the world. Um, the, the name tags, you're waving the name? Leave your name tags on the table, yes. Um, also, leave all of your questions that you have for any of the speakers on the table, and we will uh, collect them eventually, and they will be answered on the.connection.dane Instagram account. Most of you guys are probably already following said account, but if you are not, check out the QR codes once again at the little table on the far side of the room. Now, Krishna, take it away. Thank you, all right. Everyone, thank you so much for coming, and hey, I know, a lot of doom and gloom out there. There are a lot of bad things we said today, I know. But hey, this is your future. You get to change it. And so as you walk out those doors today, but thank you for coming, by the way. As you walk out those doors today, just know that from this moment forward, your future is in your hands. You've got this. So hey, I'm proud of every single one of you, your parents. You're going to change their world. And with that, go out there, change the world, it's yours. So thank you so much for coming and get to it.